Brace yourself! It's Andy Snowden! Stage and stage and stage and screen! My day. This is Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. And you will know my name is the law when I lay my vengeance upon thee. You ever seen a grown man naked? Here's Johnny. Life is a box of chocolates for us. You never know what you're gonna get. Tell me about it, Stan. <laughs> Stage and screen. Anyway, what's going on? What's going on in and around the Wrexham area? I hear you ask. Well, my first guest of the day is uh, Mr. Paul Sinha. Now, here's a list of credentials for you. He's a registered GP, a broadcaster, a stand-up comedian and a quiz player, probably best known for being the Cineman, a chaser on ITV's The Chase. He's also the current British quizzing champion, 2019 British quizzing champion. With nine Edinburgh Fringe Festival shows under his belt, this multi-award winning comic brings his stand-up show to the Wrexham Comedy Festival next week, the 26th of uh, September. In a moment, I'm going to tell you how you can get some tickets and uh, also how you can win a pair of tickets to go and see Paul in Wrexham. But first, let's hear from the man himself. So here he is on the stage and screen show, Canon FM, the cinnamon himself, Mr. Paul Sinha. Many comics I've interviewed over the years, they seem to have other jobs as sidelines, and you obviously are obviously well known for the chase. But I'm really interested in the fact that you sort of turned your back on a really well-paid, high, highly respected job to, to become a stand-up comedian. And other comedians have done that as well. And I mean, it's a gamble. I mean, if it pays off, it's great, yeah? If. It's a big if, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I took a step back from medicine, I had a national tour booked in. So I, I waited until I had some sort of financial insurance policy. For the first few years, it wasn't always easy. Um, it, you, you get used to the idea of knowing when you're going to get paid. And, and in the world of entertainment, you don't. Um, but it, thankfully, in 2011, the chase came in and gave me a little bit of financial security, which just gives you a sort of financial base to take chances and risks with doing other stuff creatively and artistically. And I've heard you as well often sort of sarcastically say about your parents' response to you giving up being a doctor to become uh, a stand-up with, with deep joy. But there must have been an element of truth in that. Um, they're all right. Were they? Uh, yeah, I think everything changes when you get on TV, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You, suddenly your parents got bragging rights, and that's bragging rights part of what drives the psyche of, of, of parents, anyone with children. Um, and so now that they've got bragging rights, they're, they're delighted. And, uh, of course, you're a, you're a regular... You've been a regular at the Edinburgh Fringe for the past, what, 15 years. This year was cancelled, unfortunately, but um, when you miss out on Edinburgh, does it feel like you've missed out on the party somewhat? Yes, there's no doubt about that. I popped up for a couple of days here and there, and it was really hard to leave. It was like, I don't want to go back. I like it here. This is my home. And it wasn't, it wasn't easy, but I'll be back next year. Is, it, is, it, is a, an Edinburgh Fringe Festival audience, is, that, is it a lot different to a normal <laughs> average gig? Very much so, not least because you're often one of about 18 shows they're seeing in the space of two days. And I think one of the things that people don't appreciate about the Edinburgh audience is they're tired. They're, they, they, they've, they've been walking around, they've been sitting in overheated rooms, they've rushed to see your show with a 50, 50 minutes off, they've seen a show about a mile away in another part of town. The audience is a little bit tired, but other than that, it's, we're just, you know, both comedians and audience, audience members are just basically normal human beings who, uh, 
enjoy stand-up comedy. And I think it's best not to obsess about different types of audiences. Yeah. Because then you lose track of the fact that the only thing that you can control is how good you are on stage. And that's literally all you can control. You can't control whether any audience is going to find you funny or not. So concentrate on, on, on that uh, rather than variables that you've got no say on whatsoever. I mean, I love, I love stand-up comedy. I, I, I mean, I've always been a fan of it since I was a kid. And all equally in love with music. And there are two things, comedy and music, I think. They're very difficult to, to have somebody come and sort of review it in a way. Because it's down to the individual, I suppose. Yes, exactly. I mean, there are there must be so many brilliant musicians, artists, singers, bands who produce great music that I wouldn't listen to if you paid me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it is like, and it's, and it's similar with comedy. There's fantastic comedians out there that don't make me laugh at all, and it's not them. It's me. It's not their problem. Why should they? Uh, give a damn. They're, they're entertaining the masses. Um, and yeah, in that sense, music and comedy is very subjective, yeah. As I said earlier, you obviously you're, you're best known for being one of the chasers on the chase. Had you had you always been a, a, a quizzing fanatic as a kid, or did you fall into it as an adult? I can't remember a stage of my life when I wasn't obsessed with quizzes. Oh, really? From the age of about eight, I'd be watching University Challenge and Mastermind. Not University Challenge, not at eight. <laughs> Ridiculous comment. No, um, <laughs> Sale of the Century. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Sale of the Century and Mastermind were my two favourite quizzes as a young kid, and then as you get older, you start recognising a few things on Universal Challenge. But I, 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 in my teenage years, I've watched it all Bob's Full House or whatever it is, or the first half of Bullseye, or you know, any TV show that had a general knowledge element. Yeah. Um, I'd watch because I loved it. And, parents would buy me quiz books and nurture and nourish the hobby and that was very much who I was as a kid so it's always it's always been there uh, as an adult when I was a medical student I used to make about 50 60 pound a week just wandering around pubs in South London playing on the quiz machines and then once I became a doctor real life just grinds you down and removes enjoyable hobbies from you as you just haven't got the time yeah uh, and so there was a period where I just had any sporadic uh, involvement in, in quizzes at all. Uh, and then I thought I had a midlife crisis in the late noughties and decided I wanted to get good at it. Uh, and that's exactly what I've done. And what a great decision that, that was. Anybody who's thinking of making a midlife crisis decision, just do it. You never know where the adventure might take you. Is, is, there, a, is there a technique to revising for a quiz? I often hear people when they go on quizzes go, oh yeah, I've been practising, and you think, how, how is that possible? You don't know what you're going to be asked, so is there a technique? Um, the only thing, really, that I would say about anything is the more you know, the more likely it is that a, a question that you know will come up in the same way as the, the more lottery tickets you buy, the more chance you've got of winning. But everybody's brain is different, and so there's no real way of, of saying this is how you learn. you just got to uh, work out what works best. I mean, I know some people who just learn everything they learn from watching quiz shows. Yeah. And, that, and that's it. But the most important thing is you, you're better off you got a better chance rather than learning a fact if you've got some interest. So instead of learning who won the Booker Prize in 1972, just read the wiki page for the book and find out what it's about, and you've got far more chance. Well, you could of course read the book. <laughs> a ludicrous notion in my in my view, but you could of course read the book as well, and you've got more chance of uh, of, of remembering it. It's not just learn dry facts, but try and get emotionally involved in the facts as well. Uh, you've got far better chance of uh, remembering it. Is there, is there like professional league teams? Not professional, no. None of it's. Yes. You can't uh, make a living. Uh, obsessed, certainly, but not professional. The only money to be made in quiz now is being an egghead, a chaser, <laughs> or writing for a TV quiz show. <laughs> those, those, those are the only um, professionals in the game. And you're this year's British cuisine champion, right? Indeed, yes. So when, when you turn up, people must just go, oh, God, he's here. No, because we all know each other. Oh, really? They were better quizzes than me. Do you, do you have the it's same feeling? Not like that at all. Most of the people in quiz knew me before I was on the chase. Right. And, unless you're absolutely, you know, the newbies to the quiz scene can often get a little bit overexcited about the presence of egghead or chasers in the room. But the grizzled quiz veteran does not give a damn. Yeah. In fact, it, you know, it, it only motivates them more to want to beat the TV quizzer. 
we're just people who happen to be what TV looked for. We're not necessarily the best quizzes around. We are just the people that TV thought would suit their demographics. And so it's important for any TV quizzer to not get a big ego on them. Just carry on learning stuff. What was the audition process like? As you say, I mean, they're just looking for a, a demographic across the board, aren't they? But It started with me sending them an email um, pointing out that I'd beaten two of the current chasers of the World Quizzing Championships the previous summer. To that. Uh, and then they, obviously with me having a background in stand-up comedy, they sounded interested. But auditions are a weird thing if, uh, in that they can only imitate the real thing in a, in a, in a very sort of false way. And I struggled in my first audition, but then I absolutely smashed my second, and that was that. I think it was uh, April 2011. Uh, my agent got a call saying I was the next chaser, and honestly, I had no idea the degree to which my world was going to explode. Yeah. Back then, we're now uh, got ratings of twice what we had back in 2011. Uh, we won two, two or possibly even three national TV awards. It all went far, far feral, if you like, than I'd ever imagined. All I thought when I got the job was, this is nice. <laughs> An opportunity to answer quiz questions on telly. Yeah. I didn't realise I was going to be a weird, a very niche sort of celebrity. But it's, apart from the, the, the chase elements of it, the, the, the ladder, it's, I think it's what every quizzing fan wants, really. It's just a load of questions, isn't it? Yeah. There's no mess and I think that not enough people who produce shows realise that if you like a quiz, you like to hear a question. Yeah. And that's why my favourite quiz show the University Challenge is that packs a ludicrously large amount of questions into a half an hour programming. Whereas Egghead, God bless them, is a lovely, lovely people. But my God, I don't know how you can justify a show with, what, 15 questions in half an hour? I mean, I heard you estimate on, on something or other, there was, it was like over 100 questions every episode, that's is it? Yeah, yeah. As long as it's a decent team, they don't get knocked out really quickly. <laughs> yeah. Because I mean, the, the the weird thing is about the, about the popularity of the game that game show or the ch- or uh, quiz show. Um, when Challenge TV came out, and and you sit down and you think, oh great, Bullseye's on, or the Pyramid Game, I used to like that, or Deal or No Deal, and you think, oh great programs, and you look at them and you think, well, I can't join in. <laughs> no. All you want to do is have a go. Don't think you have to have a joining in, but it really really helps, doesn't it? Yeah. And so yeah, I think that's one of the things. All the the chase always has lots of really, really, really easy questions as well, which helps. It just keeps everybody engaged. That final chase is an organised rotor of question difficulty when the, when the questions come out and they're fired. And so one minute you're answering a question uh, on which Japanese astronaut, and the next thing you go, what's four times five? Yeah. And it really um, keeps you on your feet. And I, I, I see people getting angry, going, I can't believe you got such an easy question at that stage. It's like, <laughs> yeah. at least one in four of the questions are ludicrously easy. It's always been like that. That's why a team of, in inverted commas, normal people get into the 20s from time to time. It's because the questions are not that difficult. And perhaps the hardest questions of the chase are actually in the head-to-heads rather than the cash build in the final chase. Yeah. That's what the final chase is about, speed and nerve under pressure. Uh, the head to head is more about getting the hard questions right. Your nickname, the Cinnaman. Mm-hmm. Uh, who who chose all the nicknames? Is it long it, time ago now, mate? I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I mean, it, 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 the programme's put together so well. You, you, you can almost uh, imagine Bradley Walsh having a hand in it. I don't think he did. I think um, I don't know. I mean, it's so long ago, and I wasn't there when the decision was made. Oh. I was very much. We're thinking of the Cinnaman, and I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I'm going to be on telly, and I don't give a damn what you call me. That's dream come true. Yeah, I'd be thinking that. Well, whatever that is, could be worse you know, for me. The time, I thought to myself, whatever it is, whatever hoops you want me to jump through, I'm happy to jump through those hoops. Yeah. I said a white suit, and I said I wasn't being serious. <laughs> um, but but it's, 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 you know, at the end of the day, like a lot of jobs, it's stressful. Yeah. And it's not always enjoyable. But then you finish your work and you go, you've just been paid for doing what you love. And not everyone is that lucky. 
and the characters of each chaser, they seem to have, they kind of grow, don't they? I mean, is, is that like an organic thing or or have you been sat down and you've got, because I mean, from the outside of looking in, you, you've got yourself and um, quite often Sean Wallace, he, you're, quite, you're quite nice and sort of helpful to the teams, whereas, you know, Anne and Mark can be a bit organic. more nasty. It used to be panto and it's now organic. Yeah. I mean, when I started on the show, I was far more, and, and it was sort of working too hard to try and get noticed. I was far more brusque and attempting to be funny and being a bit brutal instead. But that's all been softened over the course of time until you sort of find what it is that you want to be. And for me, what it is I want to be is somebody who enjoys a contest. I know Anne did I'm a Celebrity last year. It, she did, and she did brilliantly. Didn't she, though? I mean, it was it was brilliant to watch, actually. For, for As a friend, did, I mean, did you get really involved in that? Uh, that would involve actually watching I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here, which I did on occasion. But to be perfectly honest with you, uh, December is a very busy time for me, comedy-wise, uh, and I didn't get much chance to watch her. Yeah. However, I followed it all. I followed it all the tabloids, and, you know, considering that she's incredibly shy, she was brilliant. Brilliant. Absolutely. And uh, better ask you about the tour. <laughs> hey, your little thing called Love. It's a great name. Is it? Is it important for you to have uh, a good name for your tour these days? Um, I take it very seriously. I don't know whether everybody does. Um, and it's really hard. And this, this title was picked before I cancelled Edinburgh. And I've stuck with it. So I've got to keep, keep, keep to the themes. But as per usual with me, it's going to be some fairly personal stories, packed with jokes, that, that's what I do, but it's very, very personal. I heard somebody the other day saying that then next year's tour it's just going to be called 2020, and I thought, well... Oh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that either, is there? <laughs> you, can't, you can't see better than that. Uh, Paul, it's been an absolute treat to speak to you, mate. No problem at all, it's been a pleasure. Brilliant, and uh, you're in Wrexham on the 26th of September, next, next week, I think. Yeah, next week, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah, yeah. Ye